Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Jonathan made the same mistake many people make when they referred to my accent as if I have one. <laughs> Y'all have accents, <laughs> as I tell my congregation in uh, Alabama. They really do. They, um, at one point, I, I asked, um, should, you know, should I always be, do, be the one to do the, the reading and the opening prayer? Or why can't one of the other elders do that? And somebody said, in case there's visitors, it just takes them a while to get used to what you're actually saying. So we need you to read some so that they can calibrate and then they can understand the sermon. So <laughs> for those of you who weren't here this morning, um, look for the subtitles or something, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, Lefty Gomez uh, played for the Yankees and uh, you, you can imagine which hand he would pitch with, right? He was a southpaw, that's why he was called Lefty uh, in the 1930s. He was quite a character. Um, he reminds me of someone like Yogi Berra, who was just known for being a, an eccentric person. He had a reputation for his sense of humor, and specifically, one of the quirky things the Lefty Gomez would do is he would stop a game, call for a timeout in the middle of pitching for very strange reasons. Like, so, so this one time the fog set in, and to make a point, he called a timeout and got a box of matches and went to the mound and held up a match like this, you know, light, lighting the show to kind of make the point that it was getting too dark to play. Um, another time, he called a timeout and just stood in the field and looked at the sky because there was a plane flying over. And when the plane was gone, he went back to playing. And he would use his timeouts in that way. But the, my favorite of uh, these occasions was when he was pitching a game. It was a, a very tense game. It was the bottom of the ninth, and, and, and the, the bases were loaded. I think there were uh, two strikes and three balls. So, like, this is the most important pitch of the entire game. And uh, Lefty calls a timeout. And, of course, the catcher is very excited about that because he thinks that they're going to they're strategize. And so the catcher runs out to the mound, and, and they're there to now discuss something. And and uh, Gomez says to him, uh, do you have any hunting dogs? <laughs> and the catcher says, what, what are you talking about hunting dogs when the bases are loaded? And he said, well, I have this friend, and um, I, I know that you breed hunting dogs. And I told him that I would ask you about those dogs the next time I thought about it. And I just thought about it. <laughs> well, well, one thing you have to hand to, to uh, Gomez is that he knew how to keep a promise. He promised that that's what he would do next time he thought about it, and, and even if it's in the middle of the World Series, he's going to keep his promise. Well, there's another kind of oddball occasion where a promise is kept that was completely unexpected. Nobody saw it coming. Uh, it, it needed some explanation, and we see that in our Bibles in 2 Samuel chapter 9. So turn your Bibles to the second uh, book of Samuel, chapter 9. And we'll see how David defied expectations by keeping a promise with some strange timing and circumstances involved. I'll, let me give you the context here. So you know that 1 Samuel is about the first king of Israel, Saul. You know, uh, Samuel the prophet um, anoints Saul because the people wanted a king like the other nations. They didn't want to just be led by God. They wanted to be led by a, a human like the other nations. And they all had these, these tall, strong, um, masculine type kings. And we want one just like them. So they get to pick their own king and they pick Saul, who turned out to be tall, dark, and disappointing. Um, and then eventually uh, Saul goes crazy because of his paranoia and jealousy of David because God rejects Saul and um, David is anointed as the next king. And so there's this overlap period. And you know all the stories from Sunday school of, of uh, Saul hunting down David. And many of the Psalms are written out of that anguish where David is running for his life, you know, in the caves of Adullam and out in the wilderness of Maon. And they're out there and, and um, he'll find Saul uh, vulnerable and will be able to kill him, but won't kill him because uh, this is the Lord's anointed and he's going to leave it to God. And so this, oh, the whole book of 1 Samuel is the, kind of the rise and fall of King Saul and the rise of David. And, and the, the famous story of David and Goliath, the, the main point of that story is that God was showing how he could move this insignificant, obscure shepherd boy uh, to a position of power by just 
having somebody who's obedient to him and faithful to him. And so he goes from being this no-name person, the runt of the litter of Jesse's sons, to, uh, the, the, remember the king said, whoever kills this man, Goliath, will have my daughter's hand in marriage. So he marries a princess, and he marries into the royal family. And he gets to move into the palace, and so he starts learning about politics, and he starts learning about how to rule a nation from Saul in the household of Saul because he killed uh, Goliath. Also, he managed to to wrangle the military, because now he has the military's respect. Their leader is cowering in a tent while this kid goes out there and slaughters the giant and saves all of their lives. So whenever David uh, was in charge of anything, everyone was fully behind him. So this is all God's plan to move David into power. And so by the time you get into 2 Samuel, David is king, and the first several chapters show his consolidation of his power and how God grants him victory against the other nations. God grants him peace with the other nations. In fact, one of the stories just before this is where uh, the king of Hamas, his name is Toy, and he actually uh, surrenders before there's even a war because he can see that this Yahweh God is with this new king, and he cannot be defeated. And so, so David gets to a point where he's really unassailable, or his, his political enemies have backed off or been defeated or made peace with him. Um, the, the whole international scene has calmed down. There's, there's peace. There's just one little loose end. There's, there's one threat to the throne. And that is, if there is a surviving relative of Saul's house who has a legitimate claim to the throne, that could be a crack in the dam. There could be a, a groundswell of people that get behind this person. Because by, the, by this point in the story, Saul is, has died, and his sons have all died, and David's best friend, Jonathan, the son of Saul, is dead, and so everybody is dead in, in the family, or are they? And so this is kind of where we find ourselves, is David wants to find out, is there anyone still alive in, David's, in Saul's family, of Saul's line? And so let's read it, um, chapter 9. Uh, I'll just read the first eight verses to get us started. 2 Samuel 9, 1, then David said, is there anyone left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I'm your servant. And the king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, well, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him, this child, from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog? like me. Well, let's just take it for there, until there for now. We're going to look at two aspects of a covenant which gives us assurance. So we're being introduced to a theme here of promise. Well, the word that the Bible often uses is a covenant, a contract, and we're going to look at two aspects of this covenant, of this promise, um, which gave Mephibosheth assurance, and then we're going to draw some theological parallels to the way the covenants of the Old Testament affect us, and we can get assurance. So let's look at these two aspects. The first is the motive of the covenant, and then the provision of the covenant. 
So verse 1 says, David said, Is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now this is an unexpected turn of events. The, the sentence makes perfect sense up to a certain point. David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul so that I might kill him? Is what you expect him to say. Now we think, well, that's David. David's not going to do that. But listen, people, even godly people, do some pretty horrendous things if that's what's accepted in their culture. If that's just the way things are done at the time, you will find godly people who are godly in every other area, but they just end up doing what the people around them are doing. For, for example, David has multiple wives. That's that's not okay, in case you're wondering, just because it's in the Bible. But that's how they did things in those days. Think about the, the Christians who owned slaves in our own nation's history. And they just, that's what happened in those days. That doesn't make it okay, but it can show you that even godly people can be duped into doing things that they ought not do because that's just the way it is, and everyone else is doing it as well. So what was everyone else doing in David's day? What was the practice of when you came to the throne? Now remember, David's only the second king of Israel. But there were other kings around, and, and you can go and read Old Testament backgrounds and find out what the, the normal practice of the day was. And in fact, you can start seeing it flesh out how the other kings responded. I'll give you a couple of examples um, in the book of 1 Kings in chapter 15. So this is later. You know, David's son Solomon has Rehoboam who splits the kingdom, and then there's Jeroboam and... Um, Basha and um, Zimri, that's kind of like the order. And so in 1 Kings 15, 28, it says, So Basha, as soon as he was king, he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He left to the house of Jeroboam not one that breathed until he had destroyed it. So Basha comes in, finds out, okay, who's my successor? He died, but who's, who's alive in his family? You wipe out the whole family. That way there's no brother who's going to come to the throne or cousin or son or nephew. They wipe out the whole family, not one who breathed until he had destroyed it. Then when Basha dies, um, Zimri comes to the throne. And uh, 1 Kings 16, verse 10, Zimri, uh, and then verse 11, when he began to reign, as soon as he had seated himself on the throne, he struck down all the house of Basha. And he did not leave him a single male of his relatives or his friends. I mean... <laughs> The friend doesn't have a claim to the throne, but you're loyal to that house, and that house has to be annihilated to consolidate my power. Now, we don't do that today, exactly. I mean, imagine that, you know, like the Democrats move into the White House, and they wipe out all of the Republicans and their family and friends. That would make the news, right? Or would it these days? I mean, I don't know. But... Um, <laughs> You know, when, when Bill Clinton's staff left the White House and uh, uh, George Bush and his administration were moving in, <laughs> Clinton's staff pried out all the W's from the keyboards in the White House. Did you know that? Did you read about that? They stole all the W's because from now on, every time the president's name is typed, it's going to be George W. Bush. So they just stole all the W's so they couldn't do that. And I mean... It's kind of funny, isn't it? I thought it was funny. I thought it was quite a cool prank. But it ended up costing, you know, you and I, the taxpayer, $4,850 to replace all of those keyboards. So it's a funny prank, but it's, it's kind of mean, you know. But at least they didn't go and kill those people. In, in David's day, that's what you did. And so David is the new regime, and he... the. First thing he does now that he's consolidated his power, he says, right, there's one more order of business we need to take care of. Is there anyone in Saul's house, in his dynasty, in his line, bring him to me? You know, so that I can show him kindness. <laughs> yeah, right. So I can show him kindness. Is kindness the name of your dagger? You know, like, well, <laughs> like what is about to happen? This is a very suspicious moment. And so they find Saul's servant, Ziba, who was kind of in charge of the whole estate and all that, and they call him in um, and, and ask him this question. Now, Saul does have a surviving relative. Um, if you want to flip back just a few pages to, to chapter 4, we, we actually get introduced to him there, Mephibosheth. So Saul's son, Jonathan, 
has a son, Mephibosheth. And uh, chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. And this is how that happened. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So that's where we meet this, this child for the first time and, and hear his story. And it's interesting to me how the narrator keeps coming back to this fact that the kid couldn't walk. And that's how he's introduced to us. We'll see later on. That's how the whole story closes, just with a line. He was lame in both feet. He couldn't walk. He was a cripple. This is the story of how it happened. There was this panic. The maid grabbed him, and in the rush, maybe, I don't know, he fell off the donkey or fell down the stairs or something, and, and he lost the use of his legs. And, I mean, that's a detail maybe to, to just define who, who he is in the story, but there, there almost seems to be a, a lesson the narrator wants us to pick up here about how vulnerable this person is. He's completely at David's mercy. He literally can't even run away. And so here's this crippled, surviving relative. And David asks in, in verse 1 of chapter 9, is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I might show him a kindness for Jonathan's sake? And people must have been really skeptical about what's about to happen. But sure enough, it was not David's intention to harm Mephibosheth, but to bless him. Why would you do such a thing? One reason, and for this, there's a flashback uh, in 1 Samuel 20. I'll read it to you. You can turn there if you want, but you know in the movies where they, the guy kind of stares off into the sky and then, then it goes all wavy and then you, you're at what happened beforehand, the flashback sequence to let you know what's happening? This is what's happening here. So the flashback is in 1 Samuel. We're in 2 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14, um, David and Jonathan are communicating with one another. And Jonathan says, if I am still alive... Show me the steadfast love of Yahweh that I might not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when Yahweh cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May Yahweh take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. That's the flashback. The David and Jonathan story. One of the most famous friendships in history. David and Jonathan loved each other like their own soul. And what's amazing about Jonathan is that Jonathan should be David's mortal enemy. They are rivals for the throne. King Saul is the king of Israel, for better or for worse. God anoints, through Samuel, anoints David to take over but David's not trying to take over. He's just waiting on the Lord. So he, he's now in the palace. You know, he's, he's Jonathan's brother-in-law married to uh, Michal, the sister of Jonathan. So, so they're, they're in each other's lives, and they become friends, and they become fast friends. And Jonathan should actually, you know, this might be one of those cases of uh, keep your enemies, what's it, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Like, I'm going to become friends with David so that at the right time I can kill him so that I become the king. Because when Saul dies, Jonathan inherits the throne. But Jonathan is a faithful follower of God. He loves Yahweh. And Yahweh has chosen David, so Jonathan sides with David over himself. He would rather see David the king than himself the king because he trusts Yahweh. What a lesson for us, that sometimes God wants something for your life, and you need to trust God, that what he wants for your life is better than what you think you deserve. The spouse that you have is the spouse God chose for you. Amen. The children that you have are the children God gave you. The job that you have right now, the, the life situation that you have, you need to sometimes just trust God that he knows what he's doing. And whenever, and this is the golden lesson between Jonathan and David, the, the lesson we get from there is whenever given a choice, you always side with God. Okay. 
even if it looks like you're going to lose out, you do the next right thing and trust God. But Jonathan knows that there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And so he says to David, look, I know God's going to make you king. I know he's going to make you king because I trust God like you do. And he said that you will. When that happens, please don't wipe out my family. Please. We love each other. Let that love mean something. Spare my house. So let me read that again for you from 1 Samuel 20. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of Yahweh that I might not die. Don't kill me when you become king. I'm not going to try to take your throne. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house, from my dynasty, from my family line forever when Yahweh cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yahweh's going to put you on the throne. Please don't kill me and don't kill my offspring. And so they make this covenant. David's like, of course, I'm not going to kill you. I trust God. I could have killed your father a long time ago, and I didn't. And they they have this bond, this kind of like blood brother bond. But it's a covenant. It's a promise. And what's it based on? Well, 1 Samuel 20 told us, Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. So now you flash forward to the the moment where Mephibosheth has been called in, and and remember what David said, the reason he wanted him to come in, in verse 1, is is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I might might show kindness to him for Jonathan's sake? So let me ask you this question. Does Mephibosheth merit this treatment? Does he deserve this treatment? from a secular, worldly kind of point of view, no, he, he's, got, he's bringing nothing to the table. Is he going to be a mighty military leader for David? No. Is he, is he going to bring the, the wealth of the nations to David? No. I mean, David already owns everything that Mephibosheth owned. He's bringing nothing to the table. You could say in one sense, he has no leg to stand on here. He has no leg to stand on. He has nothing to bring David. He has no right to be there. He has no merit to be there. He doesn't deserve to be there. He can't build a case for why he should be here. There's only one reason he gets to be alive, and that is because David loves Jonathan and made a promise based on that love. And he's not going to break it. And so Mephibosheth has no hope of being spared from death except the love that David had for his father and the covenant that he made. Now, in the same way, you have no leg to stand on before God. So the the concept of covenant here between these two people is really a a picture. It's it's the, the way God is building into our worldview as his people that covenants are important and that they can be based on love. So that when the New Testament comes, and and we'll get there, when the New Testament comes, we understand that there's a covenant that's based on love that we are privy to, and that what we have because of that covenant is not because we deserve it. It's not because we're contributing. It's not because we have merit. We have no leg to stand on before God. You know that that question you're supposed to ask somebody when you're evangelizing them and you say, um, you know, if you died right now and you got to the pearly gates and St. Peter asked, why should I let you into heaven? What do you say? And then whatever they answer, you say, no, that's the wrong answer. (laughs) Okay. Because if a person's not a believer, they're going to give you the wrong answer. If they give you the right answer, then that's, okay, well, then you're a believer. Um, Because the right answer is, why should I let you into heaven? You shouldn't. (laughs) Why do you deserve to be in perfect righteousness and bliss forever and ever adopted into the the family of the king? I shouldn't. What are you offering that heaven doesn't have? Sin? I mean, nothing? I don't have a leg to stand on here. I come with nothing. We sang it earlier. Nothing in my hand I bring. Spurgeon said, would quote that hymn often, nothing in, the hand I, in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. So in the same way we have no leg to stand on in our salvation, 
We're not the right stuff, we're the wrong stuff. Mephibosheth was the wrong stuff. He had nothing to offer, we have nothing to offer. We are the enemy's relative. We are of our father, Satan. We are born in sin. We walk according to the the course of this world. We have the nature of the sons of disobedience. We are a rebel against God. We cannot serve him. Our sin appalls him. We have nothing to offer. Romans 3.10 says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. People say, yeah, but I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. Like that's the standard. Okay, you're not an ax murderer, great. Perfection is the standard. I do good things. Well, Isaiah, 40, uh, Isaiah 64, 6 says, For we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, filthy rags. So what leg do I have to stand on? Nothing. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Naught of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And then we see now heading into the New Testament. So here's this covenant between these two people in the Old Testament, but it's really a foundation, a a flavoring, an understanding of the worldview that gets picked up in the New Testament. Um, In Ephesians 2 verse 12, for example, says, remember that you were at the same time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. He's writing to Gentiles here in Ephesians. Um, Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the thing. This is how you get in the covenant. You see, who was the covenant made with? Well, it was made with Israel. So God makes a covenant with with Abraham that, you know, through your family will all the families of the earth be blessed. But that, that covenant gets passed from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob that become the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you wanted to join Yahweh and side with him, you had to join Israel. You know, you had to become Israelite, Jewish. And then when the New Testament comes, there's a shift. And now, for the, rather than attract people to Judaism, the gospel goes out to the nations. And we become all things to all men so that we might win some to Christ. We go out to the nations. Go into the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and making disciples out of them, right? So we are products of that great commission. But we're not Israel. Now, I know that one of the ways that people deal with this, well, there's all these wonderful promises to Israel, and God's going to keep all those promises to Israel, but now we want the promises. So um, the way people sometimes get around that is it's called covenantalism, and they say, well, what happens is we are Israel. We're the Israel of God. So now all the promises that were made to Israel as a nation apply to us spiritually. Well, there were all sorts of promises made to them about land and all those kinds of things. Well, those are all spiritualized now. There were also promises made to them about judgment. Yeah, no, those are literal, and they don't belong to us. Okay, so the the Jews get the literal judgment. Anything that's good, we get, because now we're Israel. The good part of Israel. The bad part was them. So to me, it just never made sense, because the promise to God was to Israel, whereas the New Testament explains it perfectly. It says that they are the olive tree, and we're, we're grafted in. We are, we are grafted into that line of promise. And so we are brought into this through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what was so revolutionary about that verse that, you know, the football players all know, because at every football game they hold up the sign, John 3.16. Um, and John 3.16 is, for God so loved the world. What was so important about that is that it doesn't say, for God so loved the Jews that he gave his only begotten son, but that God so loved the world. Jesus was announcing that he came for the whole world, for not only the Jews. And so his death and his blood institutes a new covenant. That's why the word new is so important there, and the word covenant's important. It's not the covenant to Abraham. It's a new covenant, a covenant in my blood. 
that is spilled for you and by which we are brought near. So let me read that again from Ephesians 2. Remember that you, Gentiles, were at, at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's us. That's Gentiles. But now, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And why? What is the motive for that covenant? Why did Jesus come for the whole world? It's in the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 8, 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So just like the reason Mephibosheth gets to live is because David loves Jonathan and made a promise based on that love in the same way you and I get to live because of the promise that was made, the new covenant that was made because of the love of Jesus, that whoever trusts in Jesus will live and not get what they deserve. So Mephibosheth's getting not what he deserves, but what the love of David produced through the covenant. And what you're getting is not what you deserve, but what the love of God for the world produces through the new covenant in Jesus' blood. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. It's interesting to me that David didn't have a covenant with Mephibosheth. David had a covenant with someone else that applied to Mephibosheth. That's interesting. Because it applies to Mephibosheth through blood. It's with the house of, David, of, the house of Jonathan. In the same way, the covenants made to Israel were made to Israel, but they apply now to us. The salvation promises apply to us because we have been brought in by the blood of Jesus and grafted in. So that's the motive. Not merit, but love. Let's look at the provision or the extent of this covenant. The extent is adoption. Look at verse 9 again. He called, the king called Ziba. Uh, Saul's servant Ziba, and said to him, all that belong to Saul and to all his house I've given to your master's grandson. Saul's grandson is Mephibosheth. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. You shall bring, him, uh, bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the King, according to all that my Lord, the king commands, his servants, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a, a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. And just to remind you, now he was lame in both feet. What an interesting end to the story. So David says, not only am I not going to kill you, I'm going to invite you into my house. And he says to Ziba, Ziba's the steward of the whole estate, he says, listen, I want you to keep stewarding the whole estate. I don't want the produce. I don't want the money. I don't want the profits, which is now my right because I've, I'm now the new king. But I want you to give all of that to Mephibosheth. But he won't even need it. Because he's going to eat at my table from now on. And I'm going to feed him. So he has the choice. He has the freedom. You, you don't have to be at my table because you're rich now. But you can be at my table and be rich. This is just like lavish blessing. He eats at the table as one of the king's sons. There's this like sense of adoption here. You, you are my best friend's son. You're moving into my house. And, and not just you. You have a kid, he's in my house too. And I love how there's this just, in the middle of all of this, there's this line just after this announcement that David says to Ziba that, you know, all this food, nevertheless, he's going to eat in my household. And then it says, now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So it's almost like, 
what do I get out of this? <laughs> um, I could also use a, a, a slice of the pie. Now, this is, this is dramatic irony because what's happened later on, that becomes important. But for now, it just looks like he, so he has 15 sons. I mean, imagine Father's Day. That's a lot of soap on the rope on Father's Day, right? 15 sons um, and, and all these servants and stuff. And so what's being planted here, there's a little inception of an idea that gets planted here, is that Zeba's jealous. Not only is Zeba not being wiped out for being Saul's servant, Zeba is getting to ride the coattails of Mephibosheth and his wealth, and he gets to be part of this, but he wants more. And if you invite me back next week, I'll tell you what happens next. Or you can just read it. It's in the Bible. But um, <laughs> David doesn't just spare Mephibosheth's life. He could have exiled him, and that would have been keeping the covenant. I didn't kill him, Jonathan. I just kicked him out of Israel. He could have imprisoned him and all his family and said, I didn't kill them. That's better than the other kings would have done. But instead, he treats him like a son and practically adopts him and gives him servants and an estate and a business and a place at the royal table. Why? Because of the promise made in love to Jonathan. He gets protection. He gets provision. He gets position. Just like we do. Because of the promises made to Israel that we get grafted into because of the blood of Christ, we get protection from what we deserve, which is wrath. We get provision of all these wonderful blessings. Just go read the New Testament and just like draw up a list of all the things Christians have and the eternal riches and the wisdom and the glories of the gospel that we get and the inheritance that is kept for us in heaven, imperishable and undefiled and, and all these wonderful things that we get, the assurance of our salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and all of this provision that we didn't deserve. And why? Because of the love. And then we even get position. We are sons of the Most High. We are adopted into the family. We get to call Jesus our brother. So in verse 7, David said, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. In the same way, we have no leg to stand on and we're completely helpless and vulnerable and we are enemies of God and yet we get adopted into the family and seated at the table where we'll get to eat in heaven. Remember what Jesus said when he, when he shared the, the bread and the wine with his disciples. He said, I'm not going to drink of this fruit of the, the vine again until I come in my kingdom and then I'll do it. Jesus is waiting to feast with us at the table. All because of a promise. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ in, in spirit, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as He chose us. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. If you're a Bible marker, I would write 2 Samuel 9 next to that verse. It, it's so 2 Samuel 9 here that this, this was all decided before Mephibosheth even shows up. There's almost like there's this element of predestination here. Mephibosheth just gets summoned to the king's court and he has nothing to offer, nothing to do, nothing to say. He just has to show up. And what does he get? He gets this predetermined blessing. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Romans 8.15 says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You get to call the God of the universe, not your honor judge, but Abba, Father. Because of what Jesus did. Our protection is complete. Our provision is abundant. And our position is to be part of the royal family. And all of this because of Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this about Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was no great ornament at the royal table. Yet he had a continual place at David's table because the king could see in his face the features of the beloved Jonathan. Don't you love it when a kid looks just like his dad? Um, I just discovered, you know, growing up, my favorite band was U2. 
And now the problem with U2 is that Bono's getting old, <laughs> right? So soon he's going to be 77 and, you know, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but he has this son, Elijah Houston, and Elijah has started a band called Inhaler. And I just discovered this like two days ago, and I started listening to their songs, and he looks just like Bono did in the early days, and he sounds like him. We're going to have another whole generation of this music. His voice sounds like him. His face looks like him. The music is like a better version of it. This is going to be like U2.2 or something. I don't know. Because he's got the features of his father. Well, this is what, this is what Spurgeon's saying, that when, Jonathan, uh, when David looks at Mephibosheth, he sees the features of Jonathan. And when God looks at you, he sees the features of Christ. Not, not the physical features. You know what I mean, though. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. You might have a bad day. You might skip your quiet time. You might sin. You might lose your temper. Who knows? But, but God doesn't lose his affection for you based on what you did. You didn't have a leg to stand on to begin with. His approval of you, his love for you is based in his love for his son. And when he looks at you, he sees his son's righteousness. And remember at Christ's baptism when he came out of the water and the Spirit descended upon him in bodily form and a voice came from heaven saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. God loves Jesus. He's pleased. It's like when your, your, your son does something good and you're just like, boy, I'm so proud of you for that thing you did or that decision you made or that kindness in your heart or whatever it is, and you get that swelling up of your, your kids just, he's doing it right. And God says that about Jesus, and you know what? God says that about you because of Jesus. Spurgeon goes on to say, like Mephibosheth, we may cry unto the king of glory, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as am I? But still the Lord indulges us with the most familiar fellowship with himself because he sees in our countenance the remembrance of his dearly beloved Jesus. And God's forgiveness makes the relationship better. He doesn't just say, okay, I forgive you. It's done. You stay on that side of heaven. I'll stay on this side. At least you're not in hell. No, God's forgiveness makes our relationship better than it ever was. Mephibosheth doesn't just get to survive. He gets to come in and be a son. That's why John says, I know you're studying 1 John in the mornings, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the children of God. Behold what kind of love God has for us that he calls us children. Amen. Well, for Lefty Gomez, uh, a promise was a promise, and the timing might not have been right, and it might have seemed uh, unexpected at the time, but he kept his promise. In the same way, uh, Jesus has a promise. If you call on him, you will be saved. You might be here tonight, and you're not in the family. You haven't been adopted. You're, you're outside. You're a stranger to the, the covenants. But they are yours for the taking. Free forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Whoever places their faith in Christ, leave your sin behind you. Come and embrace the Savior. He will not only accept you, he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness, clothe you in his righteousness that lasts forever so that you will be remade, born again in his likeness so that when the Father looks at you, he sees Christ's countenance. And if you don't know Jesus, pray tonight and he'll give you that forgiveness. And you know how I can be so sure? Because his word says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And with God, a promise is a promise. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder from your word of your great love with which you loved us that we would be called children of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for living that life we could never live in perfect righteousness, dying the death of 
ignominy that we deserved so that we would never feel the wrath of God and the abandonment of the Father, that we would be united with him forever and ever. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict us of our sin and encourage us, guide us into truth and righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.